Next up is uh, uh, Prashant, who is going to tell us about uh, the trends in China's human capital. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. I, like everyone else, have the very difficult task of trying to talk about a complex topic in a <laughs> relatively short amount of time, uh, which everyone here to now has done very well. Um, I'm going to talk about China's human capital trends, and I'd like to make two assertions in the beginning. One that a critical question that policymakers in developing countries like China face is how to effectively build uh, human capital to promote economic development. And as developing countries like China grow, their economies increasingly shift from lower to higher productivity industries, and their need for human capital increases. I would assert that jobs in higher productivity industries require employees with skills gained at the level of high school or higher. And without such a labor force, there is evidence that economies can ultimately stagnate. Uh, and so expanding higher productivity industries in China is, of course, going to require more highly skilled labor. Uh, essentially, if an individual wants to hold a stable, high-paying job in the coming years, they're going to have to learn skills at the level of high school, such as math, science, uh, foreign languages, computing, and so forth. And I'd like to make just another observed fact, and I think this has to do with inequality and ultimately inequality, not just in income, but also in human capital. That is, as countries attempt to move from middle income to high income country status, there is a negative association between inequality and their ability to move there. Uh, this is a list of countries that have moved from middle income to higher income country status after World War II, and a look at their Gini ratios. These are all graduates who've made it successfully. Uh, and you can see their Gini ratios are in the 20 to 30 point range. And these are the aspirees that have tried uh, to go from middle income to high income country status, or they're trying now, uh, China being one of them. And you can see that their Gini coefficients range from uh, the 40s to the 50s, and China is among one of the higher uh, Gini coefficients. And inequality, I, I would assert, also becomes especially a problem as countries try to become uh, high-income countries as their growth slows. Uh, James Heckman, a Nobel Prize winning economist, said what is the number one predictor of future income inequality, uh, and he asserted it's human capital inequality. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, with that sort of background in mind about just the idea of human capital for development and also its implications for inequality, to try to talk about what is the stock of human capital, human capital in China and what are some of the flows. And I want to talk about it for different levels of education, starting with college and high school. Uh, now, some research that my colleagues and I have done uh, was first to use the 2010 census data to try to map out what is the population's uh, educational attainment level at different ages. Here on the x-axis, you can see different ages from 0 to 85. And on the y-axis is the percentage of a particular level of educational attainment attained. And I think what's clear from that graph is that China is extremely undereducated at the college level. There's about 22% of the 19 to 22 year old population that was in college in 2010, and only 9% of the labor force, that is uh, people aged 20 to 65, had a college education uh, at that time. Now this is quite, I think, uh, startling in light of the fact that researchers have recently argued that Japan is not growing in no small part due to the fact that they have low levels of college education. And that's even when their labor force has a college education rate of about 39%. And when we really think about it, China, even if it doubled its college enrollment rate, would take more than 30 years to reach the level of Japan. And not only is college uh, enrollment low, or call it the level of college education, the labor force low in China, that's also true of education at the high school level. So the high school attainment level of the labor force is about 24%. Uh, and in fact, that ranks China as one of the least high school educated countries among middle income countries. So we see it's behind Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and South Africa, and right there with Indonesia. Um, so just to summarize, China actually has one of the lowest levels of human capital in the middle income world. Uh, a kind of negative way of looking at it, but I think an important way is that 76% of China's labor force are high school dropouts. Now these low levels of education in China today are primarily a rural problem. And this rural problem, I think it's really important to note, is actually a big problem. 
when we look at where most of China's potential skilled labor comes from, it comes from rural areas. About 78% of children who are aged 0 to 14 uh, come out of rural areas. And I'm going to show you there's big inequalities in terms of the kinds of education that rural kids get versus kids from urban areas. Uh, we can see that the rate of uh, rural kids, especially from poor rural areas, that's about half of the population of children 0 to 14, their chance of going to college is about eight times less than kids from urban areas. And of course, this is much more drastic when we think about getting into four-year colleges or into elite four-year colleges. I think the bigger problem and the big bottleneck in China is actually the percentage of kids going to high school. So we see that kids from large urban areas in China have over a 90% chance of being able to go to high school, whereas kids from poor rural areas only have about a 37% chance. And I wish I had put it in, I have too many slides already, but if you were to look at Korea and Taiwan in the 70s and 80s at similar levels or even lower levels of development, uh, they, both in rural areas and urban areas, the rate is near uh, 100% in terms of the high school going rate. And what China is looking like now is what Mexico used to look like in the 1980s. Um, but in fact, a lot of studies that my colleagues and I at the Rural Education Pro Program have done at Stanford have been showing that these problems really start before high school. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick look at the nature of human capital in junior high, elementary school, and among infants in rural areas. So first of all, we've done a lot of studies where we've taken IRT scale tests where we've measured learning gains over time in junior high schools in rural areas. And essentially what we find is a lot of students have negative or zero gains in academic skills, which means what they've learned in primary school, they either don't learn anymore or they actually forget that knowledge. We also find consistently throughout rural China in multiple places that China's rural students are not getting through junior high school at the rates that people think. Uh, basically over 30% of students from poor rural areas are dropping out of junior high. So what are these kids who are dropping out of junior high today going to do? Right now they're 13 years old. In 2030, they'll be uh, 28 years old. Well, these guys lack fundamental skills in reading and writing. They lack skills in math and science. They're frustrated with the school system for ignoring them. And this translates into frustration with social institutions. We have a recent study. I didn't put the slides in here, but in some of the poor rural areas of Western China, We've been finding that according to different IQ measures, by the time kids are in eighth grade, uh, we find in Gansu about 66% of the kids have an IQ of less than 90, which makes it even a question whether they can learn skills that they're being asked to study in a very difficult curriculum in junior highs in China. So maybe the source of this problem begins even before junior high. So if we look at primary, we certainly could uh, look at the poor quality of education that exists. Maybe it's poor facilities, teachers, and curriculum. I think there could be some truth to that, but I think the bigger problem is actually an issue of poor nutrition and health. And I'd like to show you evidence on that from a number of studies. And I think really poor nutrition and health is the real uh, important key. If, if you improve curriculum, you improve instruction, you improve facilities, it may still not do very much if kids don't have the level of nutrition and health they need to learn. Um, so the question is, are China's rural school-aged children really that sick and undernourished that it affects their learning? We've taken a lot of uh, data. We've done a lot of surveys from 19 data sets from 10 different provinces and 133,000 kids. I'm going to show you a few results. Um, again, this data from all over China. Some of the outcomes that we find is that there's a surprisingly high rate of anemia in China's rural schools. About 27% of kids are anemic. Uh, in southwestern China, about 33% of the kids have worms, and about 20% of kids are myopic and do not wear glasses uh, to try to correct for myopia. And the real point here is if we look at the over overlap of students with at least one of these conditions, each of which by itself compromises learning in school, the, the number is around two-thirds of kids have one of these different problems that compromises learning. And are these health and nutrition problems, we might think, are they really that severe? Are they really that important? We know through tons of randomized trials that my group has done that, yes, they are, there are real problems in these areas. And luckily, there are also real solutions. So by giving a vitamin a day, 
by giving a pair of eyeglasses, by giving uh, pills to get rid of intestinal worms, we see that each of these interventions actually does have real and lasting impacts on student learning. And in fact, the problem probably exists even before primary school. So one of the projects that my group is most excited about recently is a project with infants and with toddlers. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've gone over uh, different parts of China, Eastern, Central, and Western China, and gone to thousands of households with babies uh, aged zero to three years old and tested them using these Bailey's tests of IQ. And what we found is um, kids actually from six to 12 months, about 30%, uh, have Bailey scores of less than 85, roughly equivalent to an IQ of less than 85. And by 24 to 30 months, we find that it's over half of the kids. And the reasons for these we've also explored really have to do with poor nutrition, but perhaps even more with low levels of parental engagement and parenting. And the good news again here is that there is a lot of room, and we've seen this through randomized trials, to improve parenting in rural areas, and this has big effects on student achievement. Um, but what does it mean if this situation doesn't change if a person has an IQ of 85 or 90? Well, again, it probably means they can't learn integrated skills like algebra or geometry. It might be difficult to learn foreign languages. It may be difficult, essentially, to get a high school or college education. Given that in China's competitive system, it might be hard to have a, a vision for why you would want to even stay in junior high school. Okay, finally, I, I do have time still. That's fantastic. I've went through 35 slides so far. <laughs> um, I, I wanna just turn to urban kids because maybe there's a view that, well, we've spent a lot of money in urban areas on education and maybe it's been worth it because maybe there's these big spillovers. And what I'd really like to talk about is the potential spillovers that might exist to college education, which as uh, we talked about today has seen this huge growth and expansion uh, something that I think is a good thing, but we'd like to see how much it's contributing to uh, student learning and ultimately innovation and, and productivity. So I've been really lucky to do, lead a new international study that in, assesses and compares how much students are learning in higher education in different countries. This is work with ETS and collaborators from different countries. We first did a pilot study where we surveyed and tested uh, a sample of students in a range of elite and non-elite universities in China and Russia, and we had comparable data on some aspects with the United States. Uh, right now, I've been running a, a much larger study that has nationally representative samples of four-year colleges in China and Russia. Sorry, there's a fly just buzzing around me, and I'm trying to swat it away and think at the same time. Um, but essentially, we went to 30 uh, institutions in China, 34 in Russia, we had a sample of about 13,000 kids. These kids were computer and engineering major students. Uh, again, national random samples that were tested and surveyed. Uh, we tested these kids on a bunch of skills uh, from, uh, and we're testing them over time from their freshman through their senior year. Things like academic skills like math and science, major specific skills like computer science and electrical engineering, as well as higher order thinking skills like critical thinking, creativity, and so forth. I just want to show you the pilot results because I'm still uh, working on the baseline data. Um, basically what we see from the pilot results is something that maybe on the surface is a little bit surprising. That is China uh, starts in the beginning of its freshman year, its students have much higher levels of critical thinking skills than students in Russia or in the United States. In fact, the level that China starts out at is where United States seniors end up in, in comparable majors, uh, basically by the end of college. Now, you have to cut this different ways. I mean, we're comparing 8% of China's population that can go to four-year programs that have EE and CS programs, and we're comparing that with um, smaller populations, I'm sorry, much larger percentages of the cohort in the United States and Russia. In this picture, for example, uh, this U.S. cohort is uh, from doctoral research institutions from Russia. It's from a, you know, a sample. So I would say the subsamples you're comparing is about 8% of China students with 30% or so or 20% in Russia and the U.S. But probably the most surprising thing I think for China is that when you look over time, uh, you see that the United States and Russia catch up after two years. So this is students in their junior year. 
Uh, and what we find essentially is that students in China uh, make no gains in their critical thinking skills over time. So from grade one to grade three, there's no improvement in learning. And these are true for the pilot results, not only in critical thinking, but also in academic skills. In fact, I didn't show it here, but the academic skill levels of Chinese students decline from their first year to their third year. They decline by a substantial margin. That means they're actually forgetting knowledge. And the results from our main study, again, a nationally representative sample, show the same thing. In other words, I'm very I'm popular sorry, with I'm this sorry. fly. I, 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 I that fly. <laughs> you <right>. did, yeah. <laughs> for comedy. <laughs> um, so in other words, the, I think the key point is higher education in China in and of itself, uh, at least in terms of student learning, doesn't appear to be contributing to human capital development. So my conclusions are basically China is far behind in terms of human capital development, and this can have ne negative implications for both inequality and ultimately for growth. And I think there's some major policy considerations that China's leaders want to think about. The first is to address health and nutrition in rural areas, and they've made some steps towards that, but I think a lot more has to be done. Uh, I think they have to really think very carefully about expanding high school and college quotas, which they've said they don't want to expand and which they've kept at very low numbers. Uh, and then number three, I think this requires more research, but I think they might want to experiment with changing incentives in higher education to promote better teaching and learning. So thank you very much. Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking all of our panelists and then we'll uh, throw it open to questions. All right.